So you know. So don't put that as don't the intro. put that as the intro. <laughs> or if you do, warn me so that I can clear the air first with a bullshit story. <laughs> can I leave all this in there? <laughs> uh, no, because what like, if I just put the part where <laughs> I don't say what you said, but all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Because then no one will know what you said. <laughs> okay, I like that. I that like works. It. I like it. You can say no, though, because it is up to you. No, that, that works as long as there is no ties back to me. You know, that's that's cool. Well, you mean you said it. Other than... other, th- Yeah, yeah. Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zerrell. I mean, who wants to have sex with a guy named Bob? Oh, Bob. <laughs> just doesn't sound right. Oh, Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. 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 With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. I am the smart. I am the smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-T. And Josh Adams. Before you click it, can I add my own this week? Yes. Okay. Tell me when. Now nah, go ahead. My wife, she is pain in my asshole. <laughs> <laughs> she sanctioned this clip, by the way. I'm going to get you the real one, but in the meantime, a little audible. <laughs> well, all right then. Nice. <laughs> we, we don't need the clip. <laughs> It was like Borat was in the room. <laughs> really? Because that's another Make a Wish thing, yeah? No. Can you do the thirty year clip later on too? <laughs> I forgot to make it. <laughs> yes, you must. <laughs> the Grace one. Oh, Grace! Yes, <laughs> she died thirty years ago. Yes. <laughs> Save that for later. <laughs> We'll just start making our own clips. Can't find, if we can't find a year for the 30-year retrospective, we'll whip something up. <laughs> Especially when we get sued for using clips without permission. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, visit us at IHateCritics.net. Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook. Our Twitter and Instagram handle is CriticsPod. That's where our top fives, movie fights, trailers, reviews, interactions, uh, 30-year-old movies, uh Whenever Josh watches a movie or buys a movie, he puts it there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually realizing after I posted something on Instagram this week about a John Cusack movie, I forgot that I didn't have my own personal Instagram account. <laughs> it meant to be just to him oh. because I tagged at John Cusack because, you know, it, to get uh, uh, most movies on Blu-ray, you, there needs to be some sort of anniversary or whatnot. But, yeah. No, I... I I, you should do that. Okay. Any, anything movie related, we should post. I'm just it's sometimes you forget. I forget. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Uh, and I wanted to comment on it because I think I mentioned Andy from IVN. We was upset when we did the, the top five John Cusacks because when well, my hashtag was yeah. like everything. All, Everything sucks besides high fidelity. Or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. And then during the show, you were like, "There's too many to read. <laughs> Go to the website." Right. And I was gonna put something about being better off dead than having to watch another John Cusack. Oh, it's funnier. Would have been funnier in the comments section than, than right now. So I should have said it. Uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all your podcatchers. Subscribe, rate, and review the show. Uh, let us know if you leave a review. We'll read it on the air. Uh, where else? Patreon. I hate critics.net slash Patreon is the best way to help support the podcast. We also have a PayPal link. If you go to I hate critics.net, you can click on the PayPal link or the podcast merch tab and get yourself some shirts or whatever else they have. I think it's shirts and bags and pillows and like this badass shirt that I'm looking at right now that's got a killer font and it says <laughs> everyone's a critic and I hate critics. Yeah. Get your Lord of the Fitbit t-shirts today. Yeah, and I need to It's I, very nice. <laughs> regal. That is very much like the Regal. <laughs> uh I, I kind of do this professional. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> I have a face for uh radio and a voice for TV. <laughs> I have neither. I don't. I have a. Never mind. I'm not gonna compromise myself. 
Uh. I'm worse than both is what I meant. <laughs> uh, is there anything he's else? A, he's got a voice for telegraphs. No. Beep, dee, 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 dee. <laughs> yeah, I have to pull my voice up and post every week. I can't even hear myself when I'm editing the show. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know how you guys can hear me in the headphones. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. Uh, uh, but it works somehow. Yeah. Uh, Try to stop reviewing in smoke signals. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get through all of the various forms of communique before the end of the show. Western Union. <laughs> Pony Express. <laughs> all right. Trailers news. Was there any news that I missed this week? Oh. Uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, Star Trek Four is currently dead in the water. That's news. I heard that. Yeah, that, wasn't this the one that uh, Tarantino was going to write? That is still in development, but okay. a separate project. This is the one that Chris Hemsworth and Pine were going to star in uh-huh. together. They both couldn't come to agreement with uh, Paramount, which, I mean, they're constantly mishandling this franchise. So that that, that just makes sense. That said, they did put, not not that this is movie news, but they did decide to move forward with a new uh, Michelle Yeoh led spinoff of of a, <laughs> of a Star Trek. Franchise. They did uh, constantly prove to us that they think that Star Trek's place is on television. It isn't? <laughs> I feel that it's more of a cinematic thing than a TV thing. Yes, I think I've Star Trek 1 would disagree with you. M- most likely. Most likely. And most of the new generation movies. Next generation. Well, there are so many TV <laughs> versions of Star Trek and only a few movie versions. <laughs> Next time there is a Star Trek movie, whenever it may be, then maybe uh, I'll ask you guys to drag yourselves through the entire saga, you know, and then we can get to those opinions. That been there, yeah, of course. But this guy has. Give me some time. I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> I, I think I saw the first four of the original. <laughs> I stopped at Rocky Four, Star Trek Four, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> Five turns thirty this year. It's an abomination. Good, I don't have to watch it then. But we did have a trailer, um, but I didn't post it, so that becomes a problem. That, yeah, yeah. I tried to post another trailer, but I don't think the trailer posted just an article posted with it. So I posted it in the comments section. Mm, but I'm yeah, <laughs> yeah. Assuming no one watched that. Did you see the Spider-Man trailer today? I missed that. You missed it. Okay. Is it good. Um, it's. Nothing new except towards the end we get a, a pretty solid view of Jake Gyllenhaal as Mysterio. You get to see his face and then the helmet as well. It's bringing in a uh, something called the Elementals. Uh, so it kind of looks like Sandman and and uh, Hydro Man or whatever. But those could be uh, things that were conjured by Mysterio, who's a special effects artist or a magician or whatnot in the comics. So. It looks fun, but also kind of a continuation of the first film. Obviously, they aren't going to give us too much here. We're still wondering how Spider-Man actually is alive at this point, but yeah. I'm not. We're not really wondering that. (laughs) (laughs) Not from the back end. (laughs) Was there Uh, another one? uh, Velvet Buzzsaw. Oh, yeah. That that one I forgot. Yeah. Velvet Buzzsaw is uh, another Jake Gyllenhaal venture, actually. Uh, This one's on Netflix. And he plays an art critic who uh, takes an interest in a particular artist who uh, has died, and this artist has a kind of a curse going on. And uh, at first it seems kind of straightforward, and then it kind of spins out into something really, really strange and dangerous. And yeah, I, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, and and uh, yeah, it's the same team behind, or similar team to the Nightcrawler team. So it's yeah. uh, that's a that's a good sign to me. Is it the same director? Tony Gilroy, yeah, yeah, uh, that that sounds good to me too. I like the vibe of it. I, I like the title. The title's very interesting and different. It's going to be on Netflix though, so uh, we're going to maybe, as you stated, Sean, bring a few more Netflix films to the f- the foray. If if in fact large stars like this that we love so much keep making stuff that streams, and if we can continue to afford Netflix, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Today it went up two dollars, I think. The uh, premium is what now sixteen bucks a month. The sc- streaming four K and two devices, I think, is thirteen ninety nine or something like that. It went. That was what I saw that came out today. That's what I. I don't know if there's another one better than that or not. If, I think there's a streaming four K with four four devices. Devices, and that's the sixteen dollar range. I can't. 
I have no idea which one I have. <laughs> I'm not in charge of the billing cycle on that one. But my internet couldn't handle more than two anyway, so <laughs> I can barely handle one actually. Depends on what's going on. <laughs> Forcing more people to the dark web to watch movies is what they're doing. No, no one's. It's just like Josh said. No one really knows what their account is, so they're not not even looking. It just that's the I, problem. Is I think I still have DVDs on mine. <laughs> that worked really well in the beginning part of this show because I could plan ahead um, when things were turning thirty. Like if a copy was available, make sure that was up in the queue. But I was watching faster than Netflix could provide me with films, so I stopped that. But <laughs> oh. Six years ago. I mean, it's like a decade. <laughs> <laughs> on the better half of it, yes. It's amazing that they stayed on top of the, ahead of the curve so far. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's something MoviePass dropped the ball on. I mean, they're still around and they, they're, whatever they're doing, I don't know if it's working or not, but it, I keep getting emails. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, so I, I stopped getting mine after it went through an entire billing cycle without me responding, so... I don't respond. I still get them. Yeah. Are you sure you didn't send the spam? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's more likely. Okay. Uh, I don't know. And then I posted the trailer for Lords of Chaos. I'm assuming no one saw it. It's a bunch of really like 20 second teasers. I'm in the middle of the book. That's the only reason I <laughs> posted sure. it. Tell I did miss this, this one. Is. It is the uh, in the early 90s, the whole black metal movement where that started out in was it Norway. Uh, where they were burning down churches and killing each other. Uh, there is, I don't know, I, I'm in the middle of the book, and there's there's a great comedy here, there's a great horror movie here, there's a great combination of the two, and so I'm just curious how they're going to do this. Uh, here, one of the Culkin kids, I don't know which one. Kieran. I think it's, is it Kieran? Mm-hmm. He plays one of the main guys behind the black metal scene i'm not even a black metal fan i just find the whole thing fascinating <laughs> so fascinating because uh i don't know if you've ever heard of uh, last podcast on the left yeah they did an incredible episode on this and these guys are so so weird and it's so funny because this is a very it's a rather relatively atheist country and you've got all these people who are burning down churches to make a point and like we haven't touched those churches in years whatever <laughs> It's fascinating, and these guys are are such. I mean, there's a guy going around right now. He's just interviewed by Malcolm Gladwell, who is uh, he doesn't even have a band, but he got himself onto a death metal label in Norway just because he had a good name and because he was fucking with the. the he was sending emails to these guys, making fun of them, and you're, these guys are so heavily into the image of death metal that you're you're not allowed to react to this stuff. You just have to take it. <laughs> Because because otherwise you're not cool, and so this guy just he's got himself basically a label and a record. He doesn't even have a band. He's just a, he just has a black metal personality. And that was more. I mean, it's become more commercial, I guess, since the '90s. But when it first started, that was all based on image more than anything else. I think the band Mayhem, a bunch of guys that didn't even know how to play anything, got popular. Just not even popular. Just kind of like an underground buzz because. Singer killed himself. The guitar player found him. Decided to take a picture of the dust scene and make that their album cover, and that's where the whole thing kind of started. Oh, it's, but it's—I mean, they were kids, so I mean, the last podcast on the left does a great comedy version of it, and that would be a, a hilarious movie. Uh, kind of something in like the I Heart Huckabee's vein, if you did, you know. Or you could really make it dark and scary if you really wanted to, too. Or you could even merge the two, which I hope this kind of is a merging of the two and does it somewhat. Because it is, I mean, they were 19, 20, 21 year old kids thinking they were changing the world and they knew everything. And uh, it's a, uh, I find the whole stuff, fa- all of it fascinating, but I don't know. Since then, now there's a bunch of bands that have come out of that that are way more popular. I, I don't really like black metal personally. <laughs> But it's, I don't know. I've been wanting to see a movie on this stuff for a long time, so I'm excited that they're finally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, 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 there are two distinct genres of this, like, and you have to be one or the other. It's like death or black. And, and you think it's so weird. It's just so bizarre the way that they delineate themselves from each other. Well, it's, I mean, and I it's could... all of them. And basically, the difference comes down to whether or not you scream your lyrics or whether or not you yell your lyrics. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it's even beyond. It's, it's, it's even more silly than that. Yeah. I mean, I could take through the whole history of it. <laughs> it is. It, they're two different things. They're not even like one hates the other, and you know, you or I couldn't tell the difference between right. the two. But it's the way they dress, the way they look, the uh, what they do. You know, are they actually burning down churches? Are they killing? You know, it. It's kind of what gangster rap was for Norway. Uh, I mean, they were really doing stuff. They were really killing killing people. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, let's get to our show. (laughs) We'll start with the upside. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, the upside. I made almost $20 million this past weekend. And uh, this is a movie with a very tortured uh, road to get to the big screen. It was initially acquired... Uh, by the Weinstein Company in 2017, and then of course all of that stuff went down with Harvey Weinstein to where you know that name was pretty much toxic, and you couldn't do anything with it. And uh, this movie actually showed at the 2017 Toronto Film Festival, and then went into hiding, and then when you know Weinstein's breaking up, they sold it to STX, who finally released it uh, now. And uh, beyond that, of course, you've got the Kevin Hart controversy that came up just around the time that this movie was getting ready to release for the first time. They buried it again and pushed it to January to get away from that and to keep popping up. And I guess it didn't affect the opening that much. Uh, this movie isn't bad uh, as much as the you know the controversies have pushed it aside. It's got a lot of cliched elements. The idea here is uh, based off of a true story uh, from France where a uh, man who was paralyzed from the neck down... Uh, was essentially trying to find a, an efficient way to end his life, so he hired the least qualified person he could as his uh, as his nurse, and that turned out to be this guy, who uh, in the in this movie version is Dell, uh, played by Kevin Hart, and turns out he's not entirely incompetent, and he's actually a really good person, and he actually helps this guy rediscover why he liked being alive. Again, very cliched, but the, what works here, though, is that, that Brian Cranston and Kevin Hart have a tremendous chemistry together. They have a believable friendship. They have a believable dynamic. I enjoyed the two of them, even though they're going through uh, a lot of that magical territory. I don't want to say the whole phrase, but you know what I mean? <laughs> when they're going through all that that stuff, and it, and it is very predictable in that way, I enjoyed the way they worked together because they're so two distinct, very distinct personalities as actors, and that really worked for me. So you can take stuff that are are obvious cliches and give them to the right people. They can turn it into something, and I think Kevin Hart and Brian Cranston do that in this movie. Enough for me, at least, that I do like the movie enough to recommend it. Yeah, I didn't get to see it. I really wanted to. Did you, Josh? I didn't. Yeah, it seems like, you know, if they were going against each other... Like that's when Brian Cranston, the chemistry, like with like t- say James Franco or whatever. Uh, I hated that movie. Yeah, but they were going to you know they're they would be better getting along because you could see they probably would have chemistry, but they're you know headbutting. And this one seems to be more of a buddy kind of a thing. I'm sure there's controversy, but you you know you there's I don't know. I think it looks good. I wanted to see it. It's just been a crazy week at work and gymnastics and all sorts of other shit that. Kevin Hart doesn't do himself many favors. He does have another one of those uh, gay panic moments in the movie where he's got to give Brian Cranston a catheter and he's going on about, uh, I don't want to touch your penis and all this nonsense. And so that's going to bring the controversy that we already had back up, which is unfortunate. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in this movie. Uh, it would have been much more. It would probably be better without it. So that's that's one of the many things probably going to hold this movie back a little bit. But I, like I said, I liked them enough that I that I got past it. I always found gay panic comedy is more of a not laughing at being gay, but laughing at the people who are afraid of being gay. Like because you know it's kind of like making fun of someone from the south for you know being a redneck or something like that. Not really so much offensive to gay people as much as it's of making fun of the people who are <laughs> afraid of. At least in today, making a film, I don't think that they would release it with that particular intention. In in theory, that's what goes through my head. But I, I do think of past films where I think that they're thinking that it's a scary thing. And despite the supposed progressive nature of, of Hollywood or whatnot, it still had for many, many years a lot, a lot to come by. We'll talk about that later when we get to the 80s movies as well. It's not that far <laughs> well, away. I, mean, I look at most of Kevin Smith's first five movies, there's a lot of gay panic in it, and he was not. 
you know, he was yeah. very much in favor of it. And I know that was more making fun of the people who are <laughs> afraid of being gay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, anything else on the upside, though? I mean, it's, I'm glad it was successful. I think it's silly he's not hosting the Oscars, but people are weird. <laughs> I think he'd still be host. He'd be hosting the Oscars if he would have just apologized. If you're all, you, he said everything but "I'm sorry," like everything else but "I'm sorry." What's holding you back? Just say you're sorry. No, he wouldn't do it. And the Oscars will go hostless, as we learned this week. Yeah, well, <laughs> everybody recalls what happened last time that happened, right? Rob um, Lowe and Snow White. <laughs> when was this? 1989. You don't remember Rob Lowe and Snow White? Uh, back then I wasn't watching it the was Oscars. The, it's Man. the single most infamous Oscar moment in history. It was uh, terrible. Oh. <laughs> I should check that out then. <laughs> Being on a movie podcast. <laughs> But did they host it or something? Or no, they didn't have a host. So what uh, they, did they, so they, 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 they had a musical number that opened the show. That was the magic of Hollywood or whatever, and it was Snow White arriving in Hollywood, and she does a big sing and dance number with her and Rob Lowe. That is absolutely brutal. It is hard to watch. It's worse than Franco and <laughs> Anne Hathaway. <laughs> much, much he, worse. He really hung her out to dry. <laughs> It's brutal. It's really hard to watch bad. Yeah, the singing is terrible. The dancing is awful. The production is bad. Yeah, like I said, it's most it's among, if not the most Im- infamous moment in Oscar history. Mm. And I get Kevin Hart's why he per- went the way he did, because people are, I mean, you pull up something from that long ago, you're not the same person you were then. It, it should have been brought up. I mean, that's the kind of, same thing with the James Gunn stuff. It's just. It's bad humor, and at some point, someone has to try to be the person to stop it, and obviously, it didn't work for him. So. But James Gunn also said, I'm sorry. It, it shouldn't have been brought up. I mean, it's, I'm just, it's the constant bringing up stuff that isn't really, I don't know. It, we, I don't know. At some point, we need to stop being as offended as we are at things. There, there's a middle ground, for Especially sure. Especially with jokes. Yeah, it, it seems that way. I I don't know what what it is that makes me think that, uh, despite the the sorry part of it, of course. But but also, everything that's in bad humor is in bad humor, and sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I don't know why I was so much more affected by the firing of, of James Gunn because I think maybe because Disney knew about all of this before they hired him in the beginning, and then it's like, oh yeah. Never mind, uh, you're fired now. So, I think there there is a middle ground here to be found where you got to allow people to grow over time and get better at it. But also, it would be great for for people that are in the public eye, such as is Kevin Hart or somebody else, to at least say, "All right, here's the real story." And yes, I apologize if like that really affected you. That wasn't my atten- intention. It always get to the bottom of it because otherwise it makes him look very standoffish. It makes it look like he, there hasn't been growth. And that's really what we're aiming for when somebody gets better at it. We want to see them grow. We want to give them that chance. But I guess that's the problem is we're aiming for something. It's like a slippery slope. The more you, It's just going to keep getting more and more petty the further down the rabbit hole you go with it. The more people keep apologizing. You're going to look for the next thing. And then at some point, someone's got to stop and not just be like, knock it off. His is a little different than, I mean, James Gunn's were clearly jokes. Kevin Hart's were tweets. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're both tweets, but one was clearly a joke. One was, you know, a gay panic thing, which can, you know, was he telling a joke or not? I don't know. It he was doing a bit from one of his uh, com- stand-up comic routines about how he would be uh, unhappy with his son being gay. And uh, yeah, that's... So it was from a stand-up comedy routine. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a joke, and I don't know. I just, I feel like when it's... I really think at some point we need to, uh, you know, just let someone have their opinion and move on and not turn it. I mean, at the same time, the Oscars didn't kick him out. He he stepped down himself. So it's not like they made the move. But anyway, we can move on to A Dog's Way Home. <laughs> Yay! I've been waiting to hear about this. No. Is this offensive at all? Kind of. Did the dog do anything bad that we need to worry about? <laughs> Sniffed a lot of butts. It's kind of offensive, yeah. Uh, there's a whole scene that uh, I'll talk about here, but uh, Dog's Way Home. Uh, Bryce Dallas Howard is the voice of the dog. Uh, the dog doesn't talk to people, but we hear its inner monologue. 
Uh, the dog uh, is born uh, in this kind of in, in this amongst this group of cats. She and her mother and two other dogs are there living in amongst these feral cats underneath this uh, broken down house and. Uh, all the cats and her mom gets taken away and she ends up being raised by a cat for about a, a year or so to the point where she's actually I've never seen this before I don't I don't know I guess it's possible she's actually feeding off the cat which is weird to me actually seeing that but I guess anything with nipples right uh, <laughs> I got nipples Sean can you milk me <laughs> you're full of the quotes today <laughs> I'm going to take all these out and use them as soundbites for future podcasts. We say that at home a lot. Yeah. So uh, he's, the dog is found by this uh, by this dude, and he takes the dog home, and he's not allowed to have pets. And then he gets into a war with the guy who owns the broken-down building who wants to tear it down and uh, possibly kill all the cats who live there. He's trying to stop him from doing that. Uh, it winds up where the city of Denver doesn't allow you to have a dog that's in the range of the pit bull breed, which is what this dog is. And so he's got to try and move out of town or find it. And for a time, he puts the dog in this place in New Mexico just to get the dog out of there so the dog isn't taken by animal control. Well, of course, the dog doesn't understand what's going on. So the dog leaves that place and tries to make a 400-mile journey from New Mexico back to Denver to get back to its owner. And it goes through this, uh, has to go through this giant forest to get there. And along the way, it makes friends with a cougar. The, the, What's her name? Courtney Cox. <laughs> but uh, the cougar is uh, she calls uh, Big Kitten, and it becomes she becomes the cougar's mother and raises the cougar for about two years uh, on this journey back home. Uh, which is it's a, I know that's utter nonsense. I get it. It's really stupid looking in the movie too. I just like the name Big Kitten. <laughs> <laughs> More of a Stifler's mom situation. Yeah. Okay. I agree. But the 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 part of this movie that blows my mind. This is a kids movie, and you got to think of it as a kids movie because otherwise you're going to just get fucking irritated with this movie and how well, yeah, manipulative it makes its way home. and pushy <laughs> and whatnot. But there's a moment, there's a scene where they're trying to demonstrate the peril that this dog is in. The dog gets taken in by this homeless guy played uh, where James almost makes the dog his own and uh, ties the dog to his belt and keeps the dog there so it can't leave until finally one day they're they're in the forest and away from people for uh, a ways away from people and Edward James almost is dying and he chains the dog to his belt right before he dies so the dog spends about a solid two weeks chained to a dead homeless veteran in this movie that's a thing that happens, and it almost dies until yeah. until it's found by two children who also find the corpse. <laughs> As a vegan, this offends me, and I want apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the the dog uh, obviously survives that, but it is a that is a bizarre series of scenes to put into this kid's movie. Yeah, I mean, it, you might as well have a dog hump someone's leg. I mean, it's that <laughs> random and why would you do this kind of thing. Yeah, a lady at work said she really wanted to see this movie, and I was like, well, I saw the trailer, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of, other than the dead guy, you see the whole movie in the trailer. <laughs> I mean, you see him leave home, you see him walk home, and then you see him come back at the end. Was Edward James almost in the trailer? I didn't remember I didn't, him in the trailer. Because yeah. almost doesn't count? He's bell. <laughs> Go on, I'm sorry. We're getting worse. <laughs> He's feeling himself now. Punchy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, every every ex every supporting character in this movie is a veteran because again they're trying to manipulate you into loving this movie. So uh, Ashley Judd is a veteran with PTSD who plays to the the guy's mom who brings home the dog, and then she works he works at the VA and she goes to the VA. So all the supporting characters that the dog meets and inspires are all veterans, and so you can get to the scene at the end when the dog runs home and and knows to go to the veterans place to get back to her owner and of course uh then all then the animal control shows up to take the dog so what's going to happen all the veterans stand up and say you got to go through me US Army 1972 me I was in I was in Desert Storm me I was in Afghanistan and it's like oh my god shut up shut up you shut didn't up. throw up in the theater did you? <laughs> thank you usually you have like a, a cough button do you have a vomit button over there <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's this movie. Oy. 
Well, I mean, we kind of knew it was this movie. Yeah. <laughs> we just had to let you talk about it and explain it to us again. <laughs> Thanks for taking one for the team again. <laughs> you got paid. It's okay. <sighs> Speaking of getting paid, uh, well, I shouldn't go there. Oh, I'll go there anyway. We can get, we can do Beale Street between the two replicas. All right, replicas. Uh, Keanu Reeves and Alice Eve. Uh, Ke- Keanu Reeves is a scientist who works in uh, robotics. He's specifically trying to transfer human consciousness from the brain of a dead person into a robot. Uh, <laughs> the, the the body that's unconscious <laughs> instead of someone who has a con- well okay. movie over then so. <laughs> that didn't work <laughs> so uh, was this Bill and Ted three <laughs> man I wish I wish that had been this movie because this movie sucks uh he taking his family on vacation they get into an accident his family is killed he calls his buddy thomas middleditch who he works with who is an expert in cloning uh and they're going to use his cloning technology to uh bring back three-fourths of his family uh the the little one doesn't get come back because they've only got three pods so his little daughter is gone uh oh oh, that's some bullshit (laughs) you bring back the kids and you kill the wife that's the first rule of parenting. Sacrifice your... What the hell? This is some Either bullshit. Either that, or you bring back the wife and not the kids. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you can just make new kids. I see. The old-fashioned way. Unless you're already snipped, then you're just... You're good. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. Please continue. <laughs> or you don't bring any of them back. To be- <laughs> <laughs> Again, we've ended this movie four or five times and it hasn't even started. Go ahead. <laughs> so he's got to use his brain thing to bring back their consciousness because he's going to bring them back to exactly the point that they were apparently in clothing. Apparently in clothing, you can do that. And then use his brain mapping thing to put their brains back in them. And none of this matters in the least because as soon as they come back, it just becomes a standard action movie where they're running from the people who he works for who don't really – want to do any kind of cloning or brain technology they're just trying to, to they want to just create some kind of super soldier serum thing using his brain technology to control the weather something like that <laughs> <laughs> what they're trying to do uh but yeah just a series of chase scenes and, and shootouts and nonsense from there sounds like a remake kind of <laughs> Yeah, nah, roughly, really. kind of, sort of. Beginning's a little different. Does Thomas Middleditch also offer you fine streaming plans for your phone? <laughs> Doesn't come up. I I discovered who the who he was through that because I've only seen him in Verizon commercials that I've been aware of, and so uh, finally found out that he's an actual serious actor in other things, and so I get to want to punch him in other things now instead of just those Watch commercials. Silicon Valley. Mm, great show. show. Especially yeah, the I'll, first. I'll get to it at some point. Yeah. Best 10 minutes of TV is the final episode <laughs> of the first season. <laughs> Does he get it? Uh, he disappeared. He's not even in the scene, actually. Darg. Because well, if, he, if he bought it, I might watch the series. Kind of like the Ice Harvest, you know? The Sonic guys got it right between the eyes. I was TJ like, Miller this makes it a great it. movie. What's that? TJ Miller gets it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works, too. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> Uh, but Thomas Middleditch and Keanu Reeves are supposed to be like best friends, and they have zero chemistry, as if they're in two different movies. Keanu Reeves could not be more bored or checked out if he tried. Now, usually I like Keanu Reeves in the way that he uh, sort of is a blank slate intentionally for you to project yourself upon. That's the appeal of, of Neo. That's the appeal of John Wick in many ways. It's not so much that Keanu is this force of charisma. He disappears essentially, and allows you to project your personality onto his in a way that makes you part of the movie. And that's kind of his strength. Uh, and people say that that's just him being blank. I say that's a, I say that's actually an acting choice on his part to, to allow you to be part of the movie. And I've always appreciated that about him. And here he's just bored and checked out. Like, he could not care less about being in this damn movie. He just wants to get this paycheck and get out of there. Either that or the director was bored and he was just cloning that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to see Knock Knock really bad. Why is he? Is it bored? Is he no, bored no, 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 no. He, 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 he becomes the blank slate for Eli Roth. It's oh, fantastically no, I don't need to see bad. That. Yes, you do. <laughs> I am not kidding. 
I, I think you will appreciate it on like a room type level. <laughs> but it's possible. I mean, it's right up there with canyons and the, that that seventeen fifteen to wherever. Yeah, that wow. It's that bad. Oof. I have uh, another one to add to the list later. The January man. <laughs> 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 But uh, yeah, so replica sucks. Okay. Oh yeah, it's it's terrible. What about if Bill Street could talk? I don't know why I'm asking. We've all seen it. <laughs> <laughs> if Bill Street could talk is the uh, ladies from Barry Jenkins, which is uh, it was my number three movie of uh, 2018. Uh, it stars uh, a couple of well, lesser unknown actors for the most part as a couple who are uh, in the l- late 1960s, early 1970s, New Orleans. The uh, the husband or the fiancé uh, boyfriend gets uh, arrested for something that he didn't do uh, and is in prison. His girlfriend is pregnant and about to give birth and he'd like to get out of prison in time to be there with her. Con- considering that he didn't do what he's accused of, it makes sense that he might be able to get out in time. Uh, Regina uh, King plays his, the plays the the girl's mother, and uh, she's also trying to work to get him out of jail and uh, get him back with it, to be where be there for his family. And uh, this is this is beautiful lyrical love story told in a number of uh, flashbacks that also kind of resonates with the time that it's in, but also kind of resonates still today with the racial themes and the the themes of uh, the police and. Uh, dealing with police and but also just this beautiful lovely love story there's a moment there are a couple moments in this movie there are a couple of the most beautiful moments i've seen in a movie in a very long time uh one of which is just the two of them walking down a street kind of just mooning over each other over this beautiful jazz soundtrack it's just gorgeous the the cinematography of the scene is spectacular it's it's just this beautiful tableau and it's just the two of them just kind of giving each other looks and glances in this most intimate fashion and it is just absolutely lovely it's the what this is the kind of thing that i go to the movies to see is moments like that and that's why i really love if beale street could talk this is an incredible film and and barry jenkins following moonlight with this he's just uh he's just a, a brilliant artist and one of the the finest directors working today where could I come up with a new word after that or, or anything new to say? Because you've encapsulated a couple of the major parts about this that I love. And this is definitely a top three movie for me, too. I I'd considered it the best movie that I saw of this past uh, year or season. It, it, it's a symphony of of poetry in a way it's i would imagine even though i haven't seen to the wonder you've spoken about it enough that i feel like i know what you're talking about having seen tree of life too it's kind of an experience this movie for the most part to me is similar to that kind of experience where the the score the the music the the scenery the silence the necessary pauses that the film takes to allow these characters to love each other which you never really get romances never give you um, the moments that you identify that these characters love each other. And this one allows that to happen so much while poetry is going on in the background. It's James Baldwin's words in the background. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I was taken back by how good this movie was, actually. Not that I didn't expect greatness after Moonlight, because that was a really great movie, too. But Barry Jenkins has got something here. Um, in terms of filmmaking, I'm very attracted to the style of film that he's making, where you're weaving in and out on uh, different periods of time that are relevant to each scene. Uh, if anything holds this back from being my favorite movie of the year, honestly, it would be towards the end. It, it's not the sadness of it, um, because it is sad, and I, I kind of saw what happens coming, Uh maybe even a little worse for that matter because of African-American cinema, how we're so used to seeing sad stories. I was expecting something like that, but it, it's more uh, the convention of, of the end. And, and once you get like um, lawyers and investigations involved in courtroom scenes and stuff like that, it's slightly more conventional. And so it took me out of the symphony that I was experiencing in this film. 
but I still highly recommend it. If it if it, this would win Best Picture, I would be absolutely happy for it. It's interesting that you mentioned Malik because there's a quality to what Barry Jenkins does that's almost like a a modest mainstreaming of the kind of lyricism that Malik uses in To the Wonder. I, I was definitely feeling like I was. It's like uh, when you're listening to the score and, and you're listening to their words and you're seeing the, the the camera focus on these people's faces and it's just so right like there's nothing wrong with this movie you know and um it's that feeling of, of film nirvana that you said you go to the theater to see uh, I, I the part that i love movies is, is this movie it encapsulates all of it uh, and there, the last thing that I can say about it until we get to your well-needed opinion is, is, uh, we often, at least in my experience, we don't get to see African American characters, be it a biopic or something fictional like this, be themselves the entire film. And there's often something of a caricature of what audiences should expect from african-american culture or music or personalities or whatever we don't get to see moments between um the lead steven is his first name i forget his last name and brian tyree henry having a best friend moment in in steven's apartment when have i ever seen that in a movie that's made specifically for an audience and from an african-american author before i've never seen that before that is so neat to me that we can understand that it doesn't really matter how different we all are. I, I'm not trying to be on a pulpit here, but in all honesty, everyone has these moments and we just never get representation on screen for the most part. And that's an extra part of the beauty of this movie. Sorry, that, that's just a really great point. And that the, the, uh, the intimacy of, of two black men on screen that doesn't have to be moonlight in, in that yeah. way. It just, the, the, that, uh, that, that connection that they demonstrate in those scenes is really great. And also, also the cinematography of those scenes in, in their apartment is so mm-hmm. gorgeous. The, the reality of that moment, the reality of the, the, the low lighting and the, you know, the, the, it's a low rent uh, apartment that, they, that they're living in and they don't have much for electricity because they, you know, and they don't have much for room. And I just, yeah, it's such a, it feels like such a real place. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of an ensemble, like a group, Effort acting. This is probably the best performance as a group for the whole. I mean, every there's been great performances that stand out in movies, but this one, just everybody is just phenomenal. It, it, like more so than I don't know. It, it's just the tightest movie I feel like for the year. Uh, I watched it during a period where I was burnt out on movies. Uh, so uh, to me, it's a perfect movie. The only reason I didn't have it higher on my list was due to my burnout, and I only knew regina king <laughs> no, that's the only <laughs> if i had known the actors it would have been different uh and that's my fault not the movie's fault uh it's a phenomenal movie that <clears throat> i think everybody should see and i i definitely want to see it again when i'm more you know ready for it <laughs> just to give the actor because i know I, I i have a hard time remembering names so but uh, kiki lane plays plays tish and she's a newcomer she hasn't done much else stephen james is the actor who plays fawny and then you have uh, Coleman Domingo and Michael Beach, who are play the fathers, and they have a couple of fantastic scenes. And uh, the enthusiasm and the excitement that Coleman Domingo brings to his performance uh, is just uh, there. The tension. There's a tension in the scene where the family gets together, to, and they're, the both sides of this family, these two families, come together to have a conversation about what they can do to get Fani out of jail. And the tension in the scene is wonderful. It is just you're you're so intense. You don't know how. How everybody's going to react to her being pregnant and him being in jail and how all this is coming together. And Coleman Domingo breaks up that moment uh, with just this enthusiastic grin and a laugh. And you've seen it in the trailer, I'm sure. It's just, I hope it's a boy. You know, and just the that moment, just when that arrives in the film and the way that breaks up the tension of that moment is so beautiful. Uh, that whole scene in general, yeah. from beginning to end, it should, I mean, it's actually like a 10 maybe 12 minute scene or so in one set piece you know and it really seems like it doesn't last that long because everyone seems to get something to say everyone's got something to do in that scene especially the sister Ernestine Uh, which 
I mean, this movie has everything. It's got romance. It's got intrigue, you know, a bit of a thriller, a crime thriller, if you will, something like that. It's got racial tension, great performances, great music. And and, and then there's the the quotable lines that Ernestine has. I mean, the whew, that's some magnificent stuff. And Anjanu Ellis, I'm used to seeing her um, maybe on the side of Regina King being a sister or whatnot and seeing her so unbelievably haughty. Um, there, there's a word for it that is usually associated with the religious for the most part, and I can't think of it right now. Uh, but that's who she is. It, how could you in Regina King's moment where she just says, that's your grandson or your grandchild or whatever. Oh, Regina King deserves all of the, oh, all gosh, of the mention yeah. that she's, she's getting. She's going to get a best, <sighs> uh, best supporting actress Oscar for sure. The, the scene it, later in the movie, when she's attempting to convince somebody to do the right thing and, and you just feel for her. Mm-hmm. She's, she can't help but want to touch this, this woman that, Censor off into a, a tizzy or whatnot. You get the victim's point of view as well, but but her, she's just. It's her job. It, it's on her to make this all right, and you can sense the the anticipation in her, the the heartbreak in her, and the desire to do nothing but good. And it's hopeless oh, almost from the mm-hmm. beginning. And she gets right there until it can't happen anymore. And there it is. James Baldwin is giving you the experience of being a minority in America. It's amazing. Yeah. And then you, everything you just said, directed by a true visionary. Yep. You know, you throw that on top of all of that. Uh, it is probably the most perfect movie of the year. Uh, you know, it's smaller, uh, but it's, I don't know, it's just a tight, great movie that deserves everything it's getting. Yeah, and uh, Brian Tyree Henry really isn't getting the the attention that he deserves for his performance in this film. He's amazing in this movie. Well, I think it comes down to name recognition. But with so many other actors who have bigger names, it's and you know I did it too. You know, it's <laughs> not higher yeah. on my list because of that, and it's not fair to the movie, but. That's the way the world works. <laughs> <laughs> More Stephen James in movies, please. Um, nothing against the That's, lead actress, Kiki, right. uh, Kiki Lane. Lane, but but Stephen James. I've seen him before, and I can't remember what it was in his filmography that I looked up that I had seen, but I recognized him, and I want to see him in more things. He's currently <laughs> co-starring with uh, Julia Roberts on uh, a series on Amazon that uh, is getting a lot of really good reviews. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it myself, but yeah, I've definitely seen it. Homecoming. I Homecoming. Think. Yeah. Anything else on if Bill Street could talk? It's in theaters now, and you should definitely see it while it's there. Obviously, it's uh, one of those movies that may not be in theaters for very long, so definitely go out. Yeah, and see please it. go see it so that you know we don't have to deal with his movies being on Netflix. You know, not that there's anything wrong with going straight to Netflix, but again, you're seeing visionary filmmakers head that route instead, and it's. I like the convenience of it, but there's something to be said about seeing it on a big screen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed classic. We may need to come up with another segment name, like just because. <laughs> right, or... this is not a classic <laughs> at all. Just because Sean found a movie poster yeah. online that reminded him of replicas or somehow associated with replicas, we decided to make clones from 1973, a movie none of us had heard of. Yeah, I mean, well, because there's so many, so few movies about cloning. <laughs> I mean, there really aren't that many. Yeah, that's right. I, you know, multiplicity is way too new. Uh, you know, <laughs> <And> <laughs> whether that's a classic or not, it's debatable as well. Right? It is quotable, I suppose. <laughs> and I just love this poster. So I thought, what the heck? Nobody's ever heard of this movie. Why not watch it? Well, I know now why not because it's awful. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad movie. Uh, Clones is the story of a guy who, uh, uh, Dr. Gerald Appleby, who uh, his lab starts to malfunction so he runs out a back door and uh when he gets out there he realizes that he's already there at his car and already leaving the parking lot without him and uh he arrives everywhere he goes he's already seemingly been because everybody's saying to him well you were just here and of course the confusion continues to grow until finally he comes face to face with his very own 
clone. Uh, essentially, what's happened is that the government has somehow cloned this guy and is going to continue to clone him so he can continue to deliver some sort of government secret thing that he's doing. Uh, he begins to unravel this uh, conspiracy and fight back against the people who are continuously cloning him. And uh, this movie really finds a... Uh, some ways to use cloning to just uh, as the kind of the god in the machine to do whatever it needs to do. Oh, he killed that guy. Well, there's a clone of that guy, so it's okay. <laughs> and over and over again until this movie's over. Uh, but really, there's not even that much about cloning in this movie because it's really just a standard action movie, much like Replicas. It just uh, you know uses cloning as a premise. Uh, it, it just turns into an action movie at a certain point where you're just going chase scene, chase scene, chase scene. Uh, and <laughs> it gets really nonsense at the end. The ending of this movie is so bizarre. They're at a, the CIA or the FBI or whatever secret organization is, try, is trying to keep his cloning under wraps is held up at a carnival or a, what do you call amusement it? Amusement park. Amusement park. And... <laughs> They're all fighting on roller coasters. On roller coasters. Why did that guy get on a roller coaster to start a gunfight? I don't know, but it was the best part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the roller coaster aspect. But you know what I hated about that though? You know what really sucked to me about that scene is the film language is all off because the the first thing that they established was do not stand up on this ride, and then the second he gets on there, he's standing on the ride. It's like you have to behead him. Now you have to be. Thank you. I was ho- I was waiting for that, you but don't they had no budget. Establish that sign and not end that scene with a beheading. Here's why you do you do it this way, <laughs> and this is why I have a sauce. I don't like this movie, but it is. I have a soft spot for low budget movies, and this is a micro budget movie. <laughs> they could not afford blood when they get shot, let alone cutting some guy's head off. <laughs> <laughs> they must have had access to an amusement park. That's all <laughs> the only reason they probably ended it there. Uh, so I, I don't know. I I didn't. I don't know. I I liked the way that you kind of felt the seventies uh, by the way the film was shot and you know the way it looked. Uh, but it was they did what they could with no money, and I, I can appreciate that. I'll, I'll give it that credit and i enjoyed seeing an old roller coaster up towards the end of the credits you see that it was filmed at like a foster park in california or something along it started with an f i don't know if that park still exists of course this ride shouldn't exist anymore (laughs) (laughs) based on what i saw but uh i i enjoyed the dynamics of that scene like the the set itself that's a cool idea uh, especially if you have access to it with a low budget like that Interesting. Makes cool. absolutely no sense. In the movie, no, but it's cool. <laughs> I'm not even talking about the movie itself. Like the plot is unintelligible, and and unfortunately, it doesn't have anything to do with cloning. It's just there to give you something to give you chase scenes and action scenes and, and bad guys twist. coming in yeah, and a plot and twist. A yeah, which we did spoil earlier in the show. <laughs> so you're paying attention. I found it almost unwatchable. Um, I I definitely missed good chunks of it because the the music for this film is less of music and more just noise. Right. Um, and it was putting me in something of a trance <laughs> watching it. Like, whoa, okay, um, hold on a second here. I'm I'm actually in this movie now <laughs> because I'm hallucinating. Uh, that's the kind of weird noise sound thing that's I mean, going you have on. Have no money. You got to do what you got to do to get you into the movie. <laughs> sure thing. Sure thing. <laughs> um, I suppose if there were just a few more. Th- enjoyable scenes or or some kind of background or a little bit more innovation with the plot then i could probably get into it uh but almost unwatchable was i the only one who was watching this actor michael green and going when's the real protagonist going to show up <laughs> uh, that never popped in my head but i get why it did, did yours <laughs> i was trying to figure out who john barrymore jr was because oh, he i had heard the, that name he and he hippie. ends up being the yeah the hippie weird yeah that was a bizarre unnecessary scene <laughs> they did have money to blow up a car which was nice <laughs> without which they flame put into the beheading <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. would have made more sense. And then somehow he got back up the mountain in the back of a truck, drove right by the guys talking about him. <laughs> when he tosses himself out of the car, 
I was expecting the car to go flying off of a cliff because usually in dusty, sandy films like this, you're aware that there's like cliffs and plateaus out in the West. And unfortunately, the car just kind of gently rolls and then there's a puff of smoke that comes out of it. That's their explosion. Okay. <laughs> you should have used like just stock footage of another car flying off of right. a mountain. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, this this director, by the way, is a guy named Lamar Card, who has uh, directed a future classic for this show that we're definitely going to watch called Super Van. <laughs> it's Super about van. a man named Clint who enters a solar-powered van called Vandora into a competition called Freak Out. We're watching this movie. I agree. <laughs> Before we move on from the director, too, I was reading reviews on IMDb, and more than one person had been contacted by the director and had a separate a second part of their review after they talked to the director. <laughs> so I'm kind of hoping he listens to the podcast. <laughs> Because, I mean, he basically was, he's like, look, we had no money. <laughs> we did the best we could. Okay. So the director is still alive in theory? I don't know. This IMDb has been around a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, well, uh, this movie was made in 1973. Yeah. So it's older than I am. <laughs> so if Lamar Card is still available in, <laughs> on social media at all, we definitely got to hashtag this guy's name. Now, he, he wasn't like <laughs> laughing along with. Uh, you know, he definitely didn't like being laughed at. So it was okay. kind of like that Troll 2 director who thought he really made a good movie and <laughs> didn't realize it. Uh, yeah, IMDb says he's still alive. Okay. I'm with you on the poster. The poster is neat. The pretty weird. Yeah, yeah, I dig it. Yeah, I don't know. It, it had me thinking about other movies and just, you know, reminiscing about conversations we had about other movies from the 70s. Because I guess that's what I like most about it is it really felt like a movie from the 70s. Uh, by the way it looked, uh, and you know, but at the same time, you start thinking of movies that, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre that really <laughs> looked way better, and for probably similar budget, but also not biting off as much as this movie tried to bite off. Because <laughs> that movie didn't show anything either, <laughs> but it zoomed in really close on their eyes. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I, all I can think about now is Super Van. <laughs> Coming soon to a what podcast near you. <laughs> that is the question, if it's even available. Uh, somebody has to make Supervan available to the world, and I think it's our job to bring Supervan to the world. Uh, definitely just make it that way. <laughs> you know, make it the classic. But if you're talking about, you said it was involving a van race or a, a race, race of some sort. When does Hobbs and Shaw come out, the next Fast and Furious movie? I know, I saw a scene from it this week, like they posted a picture of it, but... We could uh, make that the classic. <laughs> there you go. I think we should call this segment "Movies of the Damned." <laughs> movies of the Damned. Just those. The, so they're they're dead, forgotten movies. Oh, okay, yeah. And then when something like uh, is can, conceivably a classic, we could do that. I could pick stuff like clones, and we could have this kind of fun again. <laughs> we were going to save this stuff for Patreon, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> if you get into clones, Amazon will start thinking you're into a lot of stuff. And so the rabbit hole goes pretty far clones, down. by the way, free for you yeah. Amazon Prime users. We should make sure that Jason's front, or Jason Mollett did not give a super van on those VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jason, how is super van? I'm pretty sure you've probably seen it. <laughs> Who hasn't seen it is Uncle Jeff. I we're I'm gonna we're gonna have to make Supervan t shirts at this point. I'm that's how much in love with this movie I am just by reading the the description. Supervan. <laughs> it's a solar powered Supervan. <laughs> Hopefully the race is I wanna know just how sunlight. super it is. It might be on YouTube. Oh good good that for you, YouTube. Super Van classic comedy movie, Van Sploitation action. <laughs> 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 we may not be able to wait till Fast and Furious. <laughs> you know what? There's only M Night movies next week. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I'm, I'm in. <laughs> if, <laughs> this and if Unbreakable. This, right. If this van doesn't have a giant Pegasus painted on the side. <laughs> Just a topless woman riding a Pegasus on the side. That's rated PG. Oh, oh. oh she could, doesn't have to be topless. Airplane nudity. <laughs> if, if it's art, 
then <laughs> you can show whatever. The big if. Yes. <laughs> Next week's super van. <laughs> and this is PG in the 70s, right? 77. So it okay. could be PG 13. Yeah. It might be a butt. It right. might even be body accounted. <laughs> right. One F bomb. <laughs> All right. I'm sending you the YouTube link. Yes. <laughs> we'll put that on the Facebook page, too, in the Facebook group for those of you who want to watch it with, watch along. And we'll throw it on Twitter and. Maybe not Instagram because that's a pain in the ass, but uh, <laughs> but Facebook and Twitter will put it all up there. Uh, if, if clones gives us anything, it's given us super van. <laughs> well, that, this begs the question: replicas or clones? <laughs> Seriously, uh, clones. Uh, a dog's way home or clones? <laughs> clones. Okay. <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi or clones? <laughs> Fishing with Gandhi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but again, I have that's distinct a small budget of, movie, so I have an appreciation for that too. There is a distinct la- lack of uh, roller coaster fight scenes in in Fishing with Gandhi, but that's true. I'm gonna steal a line that you had for M Night Shyamalan, and this guy really put his balls out there with no money. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fishing with Gandhi, they played it pretty safe. True, you got <laughs> a point there. You do have a point. <laughs> While the one is unintelligible <laughs> I don't know truly I've forgotten finishing it with Gandhi at this point it's just a meme to me now <laughs> alright Josh do you remember, your, you remember your line <laughs> Grace she died 30 years ago 1989 what came out this week Four films starting out the official slate for 1989, and I'll get past the one that I didn't see, and that's called The Extras with John Travolta. Experts. Experts. The Experts. He Thank doesn't you. have it oh down, goodness. I do. <laughs> <laughs> the Experts with John Travolta and Ari Gross, which uh, I've always had a problem with Ari Gross. He's always bugged me. And this is pre-Look Who's Talking John Travolta and post-Saturday Night Fever, you know, whatever he stopped doing good films at. And, and then... Before, so this is the in between phase. So look who ta- look who's talking is when he comes back. Well, <laughs> Not it was a very large film in terms <laughs> yeah, of gross. Oh, well, I know it was a hit movie, movie but, it, but. <laughs> having just looked at all of the grosses for 1989 this year, there are some that stand out. Like the hits were, oh my god, hits. Yeah. Like look who's talking was 220 million for crying out loud. So, but the experts I didn't watch and had no interest in it. Yeah. Uh, this is this is oddly this was my John Travolta as a kid. This is how I met John Travolta, other than uh, watching him on TV in the the reruns of the uh, TV series he was on. Uh, Welcome back, back, Cotter. Cotter. Yeah. yeah, I watched a lot of reruns of that, and then this before I was allowed to see Saturday Night Fever, I could only watch something like this, which is uh, not a great way to be introduced to John Travolta. Uh, this is a bad movie, but when you're 13 years old, it's kind of cool because uh, John Travolta and Eric Gross are kind of both playing that sort of Bugs Bunny kind of character. They're kind of doofuses who kind of get everything right, and they're kind of mocking everybody around them, and they get to, they're they're Americans who are sent to Russia to create an American town in Russia and try and, I guess, some figure out some way to use this to fool people into... I don't know. It's weird. It's a weird premise. They're, uh, <laughs> they make it kind of funny, but it's bad. It's a bad movie. It's bad. Fair enough. Okay. It pretty much lives up to the expectation, but some there's some good words behind there. I mean, I watched it so many times as a kid. I have complete nostalgia goggles for it. Okay. Uh, 1989 continued gleaming the cube this is one that i watched and it's available on prime to stream as well stars christian slater a young christian slater it's so much so that i started to look at the history of this film and realize it was made like a year and a half two years before it was actually released Uh, and you can tell it in his performance and you can you can see it in the way that like in a couple of short years here he's in robin hood prince of thieves and he looks like a grown man i mean there's a major difference going on when did wizard come out 1989 yes i i didn't realize he was in it i just knew that fred savage was he's the older brother 
Oh, okay. Okay. Bull Bridges is a dad. I love that movie. It's been a long time. Uh, and he's also in Heathers this year, which he looks significantly older as well. Uh, but Gleaming the Cube is a phrase used by skateboarders when they're in their nirvana of skating, I guess. Okay, fine. Uh, but in, it really doesn't have much to do with the actual movie. Christian Slater has an adopted Vietnamese brother who is killed, and he spends his time trying to figure it out, uh, much to the chagrin of local detective played by Stephen Bauer. Um, okay, so it sounds pretty ridiculous. It's got skateboarding in it. You'd think this is one of those movies that executives said, hey, kids still like skateboarding, right? Let's get some skateboarding stuff in there and some music that says, like, be all you can be and whatnot. And that's how the movie starts. You okay? don't like skateboarding. Do you like Stephen Bauer? <laughs> <laughs> Do you like Vietnam plots? Because in 89, there's a lot of Vietnam stuff going on. We'll get to that later. It's It's water monsters in in Vietnam in 89. Um, But it actually turns out to be capably performed. And uh, Christian Slater shows why he's considered something of a heartthrob as well as a a bit of a rebel because his all of his skater friends don't like anything, but they aren't like killing people. So you can see why that would be attractive. Tony Hawk is actually in the movie. Um, maybe his first role, but I did notice him right away. Uh, and you can see how this type of culture would, would spring forth from something like this. I remember hearing about this as a kid. It's pretty milk toast and typical, but like, for example, there are a couple scenes where Christian Slater is chasing uh, a vehicle on his skateboard, Michael J. Fox style and Back to the Future. But he's on a Corvette on the freeway reaching speeds in excess of 70 miles per hour. I'm sorry, but there's no fucking way. He's a dead kid. <laughs> But I, I got the chuckle out of it. He does tackle the bad guy with a skateboard at the end. Um, oh, and he takes his dead adopted brother's girlfriend away from him. So, yay! Yeah, Christian Slater has always reminded me of like Jack Nicholson meets James Dean meets like modern day Eddie Furlong. Oh, that's a that's a good amalgam right there. I mean, a little bit too much Eddie Furlong, I think, but, uh, but I don't know. Am I time, wrong? Though, it, it seemed to me like like he was going to be the biggest star in the world for a very short period of time. Like uh, they thought for sure that Cuffs was going to be a huge hit. I think in ninety one. Well, Pump of the I mean Pump of the Jam. He he's amazing in that movie. That movie is incredibly underrated. Uh, that's the, that's one of the reasons why I got into the ra- into radio is that movie. And then once he got to a certain point, we had Broken Arrow, and then it was like, he's not going to be an action star. Hard Rain, he's not going to be an action star. <laughs> like, even at those points, there's almost decisions. comebacks. <laughs> They're like bad decision comebacks. Sure, I can see, though, where in a, in a world where River Phoenix is a big star and Christian Slater bears so much of a resemblance to him, not just in looks, but in, in character traits and voice and in delivery and everything, uh, you can see why Christian Slater was such a desired young actor Why at the didn't time. he? Ever. I mean, because I mean, he does have that Nicholson eyebrow mm-hmm. kind of almost voice in a way, and he's got the coolness of something James <laughs> Dean would have. Is it just two eighties? I don't know. Um, I know that he had some issues. Well, I think in the nineties, but I don't know what they are. Like I said, they made a lot of bad decisions in terms of the roles that he picked, and they probably weren't exactly right for him. So he should have been Robin Hood instead of Kevin Costner. <laughs> we will get to that in just a moment, in fact, <laughs> uh, with The January Man. This is the one that I was excited to watch this week because of the cast. Kevin Klein, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, Susan Sarandon, Harvey Keitel, Rod Steiger. Um, there's more, too. I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Alan Rickman. Alan, thank you, thank you. Uh, Alan Rickman playing an important part. Uh, this is the most disjointed movie I've ever seen. We're talking about it, the music indicates that it's a comedy, but then it's about chasing down a serial killer. But then there's a romance between two brothers and one woman, and then there's internal strife at the police station. Oh, Danny Aiello as well. Um, I have no idea what this movie. Like, it, how did it come to this? I don't know because uh, it, it's got the same screenwriter as Moonstruck. I, I read this about the film. Um, and it's got a weird directing situation. Amazon says that it's Norman Jewison, which is a very well known director at this point. Um, but then the movie itself says it's directed by Pat O'Connor. Then you start to look at the movie, you watch it, 
you think, oh, this was a piece of shit that they were trying to just shelve in January. Norman Jewison, as a producer, probably finished it, and that's why he gets the end credit on IMDb and on Amazon. Uh, but it is a disaster. Uh, Kevin Klein has no idea which movie he's in here. He's supposed to be the freewheeling, um, firefighting police officer that knows how to catch serial killers. Uh, but he doesn't – it's Kevin Klein. Uh He's not good at the guy that you believe that has a mind that's in- intuitive like that, like a serial killer, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, and then the romantic moments don't work either. Uh, Rod Steiger is yelling at everyone in this movie. I, I read Ebert's review. He gave it one star. Uh, luckily, he echoed the thing about Rod Steiger belting it to the back of the universe. Um, I don't know what he was doing or what choice that was that that invited him to do that perhaps high blood pressure i don't know um but this is one of the worst films i've ever seen in my life i completely disagree i like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, enjoyed, I enjoyed kevin klein oh. i found i found him endlessly charming in this film and uh i bought into him as a as a weirdo cop uh, and just as a weirdo in general and i kind of enjoyed his weirdo side <laughs> <laughs> I I would love to say that another viewing might bring me some joy, but uh, no, I, I'm not going to watch this movie again. I paid for it, too, so that's the, that's another thing. But there's a scene where I see uh, it's Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio and Kevin Klein and Alan Rickman walking into this apartment to start setting up the killer towards the end, and I pause the screen, and I'm like, oh, you've got two-thirds of the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves leads here. Wait, it should have been Kevin Klein. He should have been Robin of Loxley. Then all of a sudden you've got a great action film. Like I love Kevin Costner, of course, but Kevin Klein even kind of resembles Errol Flynn in a way. So that would have been a perfect choice. I I want to see that movie instead. How old was Kevin Costner and I guess even Kevin Klein when Robin Hood came out? Oh, I would imagine between 35 and 40 years old. So they have the similar problem Russell Crowe had with Robin Hood. It should have been Christian Slater. I'm right. <laughs> Robin Hood was young, <laughs> not middle aged, correct? Yeah, but not as douchey as Taron Edgerton. I don't know. I have Everybody no idea about Robin, Robin Hood. Hood. <laughs> but needless uh, to say, Robin Hood is an ageless fictional character. Oh, he's real. <laughs> he's real to me, damn it. He's in the hearts and minds of everyone. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the last film from 89 is uh, one of the three, perhaps more, that I haven't discovered yet. Uh, Water Monster Movies of 1989, Deep Star 6. I saw Leviathan, which we will get to in March, was my first theater-rated R film. My mom took me to when I was 10 years old, was in- exceedingly excited about it because I enjoyed Aliens so much, and they kept pumping it up as, if you like Aliens, blah, blah, blah. Uh and, but earlier in this year, Deep Star 6 had come out, and she had saw that and said, yeah, it's not very good, but, you know, kind of fun. It's got the guy from My Two Dads in it, which it does. Greg Evigan is one of the leads, if you guys remember that show from the 80s. I'm sure that at least a couple of our listeners from the Awesome 80s podcast would Who was the would other? Know. Who was the other dad? Paul Reiser. Was an Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did have that discussion this week about my two dads uh but anyways so uh, before you move on really the advertisement was if you like aliens not the movie but just aliens in general <laughs> you right. might like this movie right but the, you know what this film is set underwater of course but it, it, like a, a navy base that they're trying to figure out a way to plant nuclear weapons uh so there are no aliens in it? Hold on a second. That's the thing. Oh. About 75% into the film is when we first get an idea that there's actually a monster involved. Otherwise, it's just um, crew tensions and, and you know the typical underwater strife where you've got to decompress and, and you're always worried that you're so deep you're going to implode and people are going to go crazy like uh, Miguel Ferrer's character kind of does. Uh, but once we actually get the monster, it's more of an area that they accidentally um, blew up and it has released some things, kind of like the Meg in a way, than actual aliens. But the tagline for this film was like underwater, no one can hear you scream or something like that. You know, it, it was because you'll drown instantly. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, 
it's it's a bad movie, but it does have good production values. And I noticed uh, watching it this time that the producers are Mario Casar and Andrew Vagina or or Vanya, whatever the case may be. These are the guys that are behind like uh, the Terminator Two f- um, production and and some very large expensive films like Universal Soldier that look great but are very short on story. This definitely qualifies. There are two taglines for this movie. Uh, one is, not all aliens come from space. There you go. And the other one is, save your last breath to scream. To scream. <laughs> not all aliens come from space. Well, there's no indication that it's an alien. Not in one, at one point in this film do they say, oh, well that shit's an alien. Do you know who directed this movie? Alan Smithy? Sean, Sean S. Cunningham, yeah. the oh. director of Friday the 13th. Oh, I knew that I had heard that name before. Okay. So it's like Friday the 13th meets, meets the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, this and Leviathan, uh-huh. along with the abyss that come out later this year, too, make me wonder who got word of the big script first. Which one was the big one? I assume it was The Abyss. I assume that studios heard James Cameron was going to make a a movie underwater, blah, blah, blah. And then people started leeching off of the idea and made their own versions. Kind of like... Was James Cameron... Well, I guess he did have aliens already. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Is that all from 88? That is. Or 89? Yes. (laughs) All right. Next week... We have Supervan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Unbreakable and Glass as well. Oh, yeah, that stuff. <clears throat> I'm sure it'll be fun. I was more excited before I heard there was a Supervan. <laughs> I have a feeling that's going to be the most fun part of the episode. I just don't know how Glass lives up to expectations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you know. my expectations are so high. Like, with Split, I, I, it was just kind of, it's another M. Night Shyamalan movie. It looks kind of neat. I'll give it a shot. And then it blew my mind. With this one, it's like, all right, you got Unbreakable and you got Split. Good luck. Currently uh, 41% on Rotten Tomatoes are the reviews for Glass. Yeah, but how many people want to see it? That's what I want to know. (laughs) I didn't even mention that. (laughs) The review of Replicas. Did you see this? No. Uh, Josh, so apparently, so I was watching a, a, a commercial for Replicas, and in the commercial they said 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, of course, it's not right. It was not ninety three percent on Rotten Tomatoes in terms of rec- oh, critical reviews. Because okay, yeah. at the time, because when you re- told us that, there were still no review. There was no score for the reviews mm-hmm. yet. Yeah, <laughs> there was only one review on there, and it was in Spanish, and it was it was negative. That was green. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. I got excited when I saw that. I went to read reviews to see what other people are saying about it, and I found that there are no reviews. But then I noticed the want to see. In the corner, which is a little thing that Rotten Tomatoes does, which every movie has about 96, 93, 96% want to see in terms of Rotten Tomatoes users. That's the number that they put in there and said, Rotten Tomatoes, 93%. Now, in fairness, <laughs> it did say Rotten Tomatoes, 93%. I mean, it's like saying you have the number one comedy in America when The Hangover is already out that year and you just happen to come out a week when nothing else came out. (laughs) (laughs) Or, you know, you eat fast food and they call it food. (laughs) What's the difference? Yeah, it's it's like with everything else. If you have knowledge of something like who is in Replicas, Keanu Reeves, lower your expectations then and know more about the films and who's making them and what month that you're in at the theater and, and start to readjust yourself. I agree. But yeah, that's next week's show. Uh, before we move on, I want to thank our Patreon supporters and our key group level, Charlie Messing and Jason Bryant. <laughs> And our character actor level, Christina Cato and Cousin Jeff. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And our special effects level, we have Corey from Ivy Envy and Sarah Ward. May the force be with you. In our associate producer category, we have Jason Mollett. Everybody has to eat shaving cream once in a while. And in our movie star level, we have Uncle Jeff and Dave Sievers. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! If you want to be a Patreon supporter, head over to IHateCritics.net slash Patreon. Or you can also go to IHateCritics.net and click on the PayPal link. And you can also buy a shirt there, too. IHateCritics.net. There's a tab uh, for podcast merch uh, if you want to 
shirt for the show. You too can make your child look as annoyed as Bob's children in those shirts. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I made them do that. <laughs> you think? <laughs> well, they, I was making them, like my son was all excited taking a picture on the stairs and my daughter, he had put all the Pez dispensers that I have on my landing. I don't know if you noticed they were knocked over. They usually are knocked over, but mm-hmm. he decided to put them back up and stand them up. Right as I was taking the picture, she knocked the Pez dispensers <laughs> over. <laughs> and so there's a look of on his face of, what did you do that for? Uh, but yeah, and I, I, I want to try to come up with some more shirts this year too. you know, send me your ideas. I know Jason Mollett sent me his and, uh, it's just a matter of doing them and not just necessarily a word, but maybe a design of sorts. I'm trying to think of somehow to work in Cameron Diaz's shoulder without putting her face on a shirt and <laughs> possibly get in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, uh, look forward to the super van t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. The super van fishing with Gandhi, the greasy strangler. I mean, there's things that I want to, I don't know. Just a matter of making it work. Uh, what else am I forgetting? Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. S- subscribe to the show. Write and review the show. Tell your friends. Otherwise, I think that's our show. We'll see you next week. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone can have. And we'll never, ever, 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 ever leave each other. We're the best friends. Three friends that anybody can have. I mean the three best friends that anybody can have. The friends that three best friends Unforgiven or Anaconda? Unforgiven. Unforgiven. Ocean's 12 or Ever After? Ocean's 12. I'll go with Ever After. I'll go with Ocean's 12. Carrie, 1976 or Love Actually? Love Actually. Agreed. I'll go Carrie, but I'm not going to complain about it. Identity or Fun with Dick and Jane? Oof. Uh, <laughs> uh, I gotta decide here whether or not to use my fishing with Gandhi. Oh, uh, <laughs> I like identity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'll go with identity. Me too. Transformers: Revenge of the Fallen or Twins? Twins. <laughs> twins. Thirty Days of Night, scary movie two. Thirty Days of Night. I haven't seen it, but you guys have waxed poetic, and I'll lose if I vote for the other one anyway. So, yeah, I like that movie. The X Files or Rocky Two. Hmm. Not gonna hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they're go- both kind of uh, audience pleasing movies in a very different way. Um, I think if I if you put it to me that I had to watch one or the other, I'd probably watch Rocky Two. I enjoy the X Files movies, but Rocky Two it is. Oh, I didn't have to vote. <laughs> Blazing Saddles or Harry Potter and the pris- Prisoner or somewhere. <laughs> Azkaban. It's a very good Harry Potter movie, but it's no Blazing Saddles. <laughs> uh, it's a decent Mel Brooks comedy, but it's no Harry Potter. <laughs> so. Hmm. It's Blazing Saddles, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, 2011, or Crash, 2004. <laughs> Arthur, <laughs> Arthur, Arthur, Arthur. I haven't seen Arthur, 2011, but Fishing with Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, National Treasure, Book of Secrets, or Blade Runner? Blade Runner. Blade Runner. The Dark Knight or The Last of the Mohicans? The Dark Knight. Dark Knight. Wanted or Lord of the Rings Return of the King? Wanted. Oh! 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 Take thy beak from without thy heart. <laughs> uh, it's Return of the King. Wanted sucks. I like Wanted. I would all go with Lord of the Rings. Oh. <laughs> I just had to do that. To oh, I like Wanted enough. Not. I mean, don't think I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> That's why the shocked look was kind of feigned, but... <clears throat> Uh, the Simpsons movie or Curious George? Simpsons. Simpsons. I'm sure that's a straight-to-video movie. Ooh, oh man, this is an easy one, I guess. The Hangover or Pulp Fiction? Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction? 
uh, LA Confidential or District B13. LA I, Confidential. Okay, I don't even know what that other one oh, is. Oh, the other one's a French action movie, so you can just change it to another yeah, one. I already picked LA Confidential, so we're good. <laughs> Batman Begins or Rear Window in 1954. Rear Window. Batman Begins. It's rear Window for me. Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, Bad Santa. Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang. Agreed. Yes. Inglorious Bastards, X Men, The Last Stand. Inglorious Bastards. Agreed. Army of Darkness, The Silence of the Hams. <laughs> <laughs> Not lambs, it is hams. Has seen <laughs> Was that? that title offensive to a vegan? <laughs> Has anybody seen that other one? I have not I seen I think that we one. need to switch to another one. Yeah. Oh, God damn it. Army of Darkness, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. <laughs> I have to go Jay and Silent Bob as much as I love Army of Darkness. Yeah. Uh, Jay and Silent Bob by a mile. <clears throat> License to Kill or Click? Jesus. <laughs> Thankfully, I retained my fishing with Gandhi. That's click for me. <laughs> <laughs> I own license to kill. I, I guess I'll have to take that one. I guess I'll just have to refresh. <laughs> the Devil's Advocate or Notorious 2009. I've never seen Notorious. Notorious. Is that the, the, that's the Biggie uh, Smalls uh, Did you see that one? No, no. Uh, you can skip that one, I guess. All I've right. seen it. But... The Devil's Advocate or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Eternal Moon. Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yep. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, or Super 8? Super 8. Super 8. Yep. Hulk 2003 or Resident Evil 2002? Hulk. Hulk. Lake Placid, Finding Neverland. Finding Neverland. Yeah, it's Finding Neverland. Yeah. Starship Troopers or Million Dollar Baby? Million Dollar Baby. Million Dollar Baby by a mile. <laughs> Pause way too long. <laughs> you couldn't think of the words. I was trying to think of something nastier to say about Starship Troopers, but. 101 Dalmatians, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Which 101 Dalmatians? 96, live action. Yeah, it's still that one, I guess. I have yet to see a Power Rangers movie, let alone many. <laughs> they would discern which version that one is. <clears throat> I'll just let Sean. I haven't seen it either. Uh, Love Actually or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? Ooh, that is, that's tough. Um, I think because it would be the one I'd watch immediately, it would be Love Actually. Uh, based on my rankings, Crouching Tiger. I'll go Crouching Tiger, too. I mean, I'm not to vote against Love Actually twice. I do like it. I just like the other two better. Road Trip or Watchmen? Road Trip. Watchmen. <laughs> Watchmen. The Social Network or Iron Man 2? The Social Network, but I love Iron Man 2. As do I, but I will go with Social Network. Aaron Sorkin is talking about a sequel this week. Hmm. and how it's about uh, Twitter? No, uh, <laughs> about Facebook now. So he is says it actually a sequel, or is it just about what's going on with Facebook? He says that he would like to make one. That's Aaron Sorkin, so please do. Secret Window or The Blair Witch Project? It's actually tough for me because I really I think Secret Window is desperately underrated, but uh, I think I think the cultural impact and the artistry of the Blair Witch wins out. I, I would take Secret Window. It's Blair Witch, obviously, the Two Towers or Amadeus. Amadeus. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I mean, it's, it can't be too upset. It's Amadeus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just don't like voting against. You don't got to vote against it. I'll just vote against it. (laughs) (laughs) Two towers. I'm a deus. From hell or Hannibal? From hell. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, I'll go Hannibal, but it's real close. Real close. I'll go Hannibal, too, but I thought I'd be the only one. No, Hannibal's that, more of like a Freddy version of Hannibal. It, it's symphonic in its own way too. I, I, I think it's underrated. Not as good as perhaps it should have been, but underrated. Is that the Ridley Scott one? Mm-hmm. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vertigo or Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't 
don't know how Rocky has never come up against anything good. <laughs> uh, vertigo. <laughs> you know what though the the opening to Vertigo, uh, where the the music is playing by Elmer, it's Elmer Bernstein, if I'm not mistaken, that does the score for that, and uh, the the way that it kind of puts you into a trance and you're looking at it and whatnot, it's got a similar juxtaposition to the Alien Three score. Um, I know that's a totally bonkers idea here, but I they're linked in a in a way in my head only, but I will take Aliens. Vertigo. All right, something fun to go out on. Let's see here. Not fun enough. Neither is that one. That one. Come on. Uh, we'll do a real one. Psycho or LA Confidential? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um. That's tough. Uh, Psycho. Uh, I, I gosh, I almost want to put those like back to back viewing wise and make that decision. I'll I'll take LA Confidential, but feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I will too. I I think it's more of the fact that it's kind of our generation's you know movie from our generation that I can not necessarily relate to, but it was I got to experience it. You know when it happened when it came out and yeah. Psycho I. You know, you know everything that already happened in it, so it's it's hard to truly experience it the way everybody did when it first came out. But yeah, we're done.